What's up everybody, how's it going? It's Burke aka Dan's Great here and this is a special video dedicated to this mean little machine that I built over the last couple of weeks here in the UK. So since 2013 I've been using the same desktop PC to do all of my content creation. Um, that PC has been an absolute workhorse, it's just it's done so much rendering and like editing and gaming and all that stuff over the years and it hasn't skipped a beat. I mean I've always been very happy with it. Um, a friend of mine helped me build it back in 2013 and while it still runs really well to this day and it's helped me to produce thousands of videos and hasn't really skipped a beat at all, it's been six years now and I wanted to, to up my game. I had a plan in 2019 to start building a PC that's going to be able to play 4K games, uh, create 4K content and even when it's not 4K content or that kind of stuff, it's just generally going to be a much faster machine and it's going to help me to produce better quality videos and help me to produce them more quickly. So that's why I set about building this thing. Um, I did weeks and weeks of research because there were certain things that I wanted to make sure the machine had. Uh, some things that are obviously just generally important things like I want the CPU to be good. But for me personally, one thing that was important was the fact that it was small form factor. So as you can see, I mean, this thing is like pretty tiny. And considering the, the strength of the components in there, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty small machine and it's something that's much easier to transport than the current machine that I have. So that's one of the main things that made this build a little bit more of a challenge for a newbie like me. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about the process of putting this thing together, all the way from me kind of sitting down and trying to think of what components I wanted, uh, why I wanted those, did I change my mind on certain things, etc. how I obtained the components, and what the building process was like, because it was my first ever build. Uh, it took me more than half a day to do, and there were like things that went wrong during it and all that kind of stuff. So we'll talk about all of this and I'll discuss like um, how I'm feeling about the build at the end of it. Am I happy with it? Is it performing how I want it to perform? And all of that kind of stuff. So you guys hopefully that are into PCs and into tech and that kind of stuff should enjoy this video. So without much further ado, let's get into it and talk about the process from idea to completion of how I built this little beast. What's up everybody, how's it going? Let's get into the discussion of this PC that I built. So I'm going to start with the case because that's a important consideration in the build that I was trying to do because one thing I was thinking about with this whole thing is um, my future is never certain in terms of where I'm going to be staying for the next few months at any given time. So if I'm going to be in England for two or three months, I'd like my PC to be with me instead of having to rely on my laptop to try and do my PC's job for a few months and obviously vice versa in Turkey. So. One of my main goals was to try and build a PC that I could fit into uh, my hand luggage when I was going between London and Istanbul. So I had to research uh, small form factor cases that would do the job. And I ended up actually buying three to test. Now, if you do your research and you go into small form factor and all that stuff, there's a few cases that are kind of standout ones that everybody likes to use. But there was a few problems with those. So uh, one of the ones that's most popular is called the N-Case M1. But not only is this a lot more expensive than what I was kind of hoping to pay for a case, uh, it's also a little bit more difficult to get hold of and it takes a long time to ship over from the US, it's not as accessible and all that kind of stuff. So I ruled that one out for that reason. And there was another one called um, the Ghost S1 and I ruled that one out for similar reasons. So when it comes to small form factor, there aren't too many middle range cases. It's either uh, very cheap stuff that's like 30, 40 quid that I don't think will do a good job, or it's stuff that's upwards of 200 pounds and closer to 300 pounds just for a case. And I was like, well, I don't want either one because I tested them out and I wasn't too happy with um, the, the cheap one. I think it was a Sharkoon case. It was called the Sharkoon QB1 or something like that. And um, it seemed okay, but I just, I didn't feel confident like putting together all of these um, high-end parts in there and having the right kind of airflow and the right kind of stability that I wanted for a system like that. So I ruled that one out. Uh, next case was the NZXT H100i, I think it's called H200i, something like that. It's basically like the smallest one that they have of that kind. And it's kind of a small form factor case, but it's not. Basically, from what I've researched, the rule of thumb is that if it's under 20 liters in capacity, then it's a true small form factor case. If it's above that, then it's more like kind of MATX, that sort of thing. And yeah, I mean, lo and behold, I got the, the NZXT and it turned out to be too big for my carry-on luggage and the whole thing was a little bit too heavy and a bit bigger than it needed to be. So I ruled that one out as well and I was on the hunt for a case where I could liquid cool my CPU at the same time 
and it was still under the 20 litre small form factor threshold and I could carry it in my hand luggage as well. So a bit more research and I found a case called the Ophion Evo. Now this is made by a company called Ryzen Tech and on paper it had pretty much all the specs that I was after because I could fit um, a, as big a graphics card as I needed in terms of the length. Uh, I could fit a 240 millimeter liquid cooling solution as well to cool my CPU. So those were two of the, the main things that I was after and it also would fit inside my hand luggage and it was priced at around £130. So it was close to about half the price of the top of the line small form factor cases and it still did most of the things that I needed from it and that I wanted it to do. So I was like, okay, let's give this case a go. And it's fairly readily available on like eBay and Amazon and those kind of places. So in that sense, it was easy to access, it was easy to return and all that kind of business. So I got myself an Affiant Evo and that is the case that I started my build with. Uh, I'm pretty happy with it. It's in terms of like the small form factorness, it definitely does fit into that bracket. It's not quite as compact as some of the the highest range cases, but in terms of what I needed it for, it was it was perfectly serviceable. Uh, it's got the aluminium build as well. It feels really premium to me, and it's got the tempered glass sides as default. Now, depending on the kind of components that you're running in here, um, the side panel being glass is not too much of a big deal. It seems to have enough ventilation to keep things uh, cool enough, and it looks really really pretty. Now, for me personally, I tried it with the glass panels and on one side of the case, it's absolutely no problem. But on the other side of the case, I've got an issue. So I'll talk to you guys about that once I've actually run you through the parts and the build itself. So case wise, I went for the Affiant Evo and I'm generally very happy with the case as it stands. But there's more on that a little bit later. Of course, one of the first major decisions I had to make was, am I going for Intel or am I going for AMD? And for me, this was really difficult. I literally spent weeks on this. Uh, it was first July when I was looking into the parts and what I wanted to build and all that kind of stuff. And I had my heart set on the, the i9-9900K. That is the CPU that I wanted as my like main hardcore CPU that could get all of the work that I wanted done. And it had the best gaming performance of like a generally consumer slash prosumer level but then people were like hold up the new ryzen chips are coming check those out they might be really really good so i was like okay fine i'll wait and i'll see if they're any good and they came out and yeah they were really good like based on what i was seeing from all of the reviews and stuff they performed just as well as the i9 9900k uh, in terms of like multitasking things it definitely was better even though the i9 was better for gaming which is what i was planning to use it more for because for me like my multitasking isn't really that heavy. It's just like, I might be rendering videos, I might be doing something else at the same time. So I don't have this big crazy, like I'm, I'm running um, a full HD stream and I also wanna render videos at the same time and I wanna do this other stuff. So I don't have like a huge multitask workload. So in terms of single core speed and just in terms of general driver, uh, reliability, compatibility with the software that I use and all that kind of stuff, Intel was still feeling like the better choice for me. But I wasn't like completely sold on Intel as well. Now the, the Ryzen came out and it was supremely popular. And I was like, should I get it? Should I not? There was a few times where I literally, I went onto like one of the sites and I put one of them in my basket and I was almost ready to check out. And I was just like, oh, I'm not quite sure. Should I do it? Should I not? And basically the, the answer that I came up upon was, I'm gonna wait for the GPU first. Because at the same time, um, in terms of GPU, I was looking to get a 2080 because the 2080 Ti just seemed way overpriced. It's like it was going to cost more than half of what I planned for the entire build. So I was like, I'm not going to go with Ti, but I still want high end performance. And at the end of the day, there is you can't escape um, having to pay more than you should for high end GPU performance as it stands because of the whole data mining thing, uh, the fact that AMD has not produced GPUs that can compete at the top end of what Nvidia is doing. I was like, I'm going to have to just, you know, bite the bullet here and just pay whatever I have to pay to obtain something like a 2080. So that was the kind of thought process I had. And then I found out that the 2080 Super was coming out and the 2070 Super was coming out. So I was like, well, OK, I'm probably going to have to wait, see what the performance is like. Are these Supers really that Super? Uh, how are they affecting prices on their predecessors and all that kind of thing? And this clashed with the time where I was going to go to Turkey for the summer. So the initial plan was to build the whole thing in July, take it with me to Turkey and start using it there. But when all of this stuff came up, I was like, you know what, let's not rush into it. Like I don't need the PC today. 
let's wait until September. Uh, let's see what's going to happen with these AMD Ryzen chips. Like, are they truly going to stomp all over the, the 9900K? Or is it going to be kind of, you know, they're going to be head to head and it's going to depend more on your usage case for which one you buy. So I thought that's one thing. Second thing, let's see what happens with these super cards. Uh, see what happens with prices and hopefully in September I should be able to make a much more informed decision because these two parts are literally the most expensive and most important parts of the whole build. So I delayed until September for that reason. Okay, so I came back in September to give this thing another go and to see what was going on with AMD versus Intel and with the GPU. So with AMD, uh, there were certain things that I wasn't overly happy with, with stuff like um, their boost clocks. Like a lot of people weren't able to hit the boost clocks that they were advertising. And in order to do it, you had to generally use a higher end motherboard. And I wasn't too sure because I had to get a mini ITX motherboard. Uh, I wasn't really overly impressed with um, the advertised performance versus what they were giving. Now, regardless of that, it performs extremely well and I decided that pretty much I couldn't go wrong with either one. For my own personal usage case, I would have been pretty much just as happy with either one. Now, one thing that swung it for me for Intel was just the fact that it is still superior in a lot of games. And since I'm going to be recording games, hopefully, using this PC, and I'm going to be using recording software that's going to give me an FPS hit as well. I figured that the more overhead I have with uh, FPS in games, the less of an impact the recording is going to have on me as well. So that was one little thing that I was considering. But beyond all of this, the thing that swung it for me most in the end was to do with cost and availability. Because in September in the UK, the 3900X, which was the CPU that I wanted to buy, was pretty much sold out everywhere. Either there were places that you could buy it for close to retail, but it was like one or two months away, or there were places that had a few in stock, but they were like £530, which was, I think, about something like £50 higher than, than the price that it came out at, which I wasn't really happy with. So not only was I going to pay £530, but for me, it didn't have a huge difference over the i9 9900K that I wanted to buy. So when I was looking at it and I was comparing it, I could find 9900Ks for about £430 uh, from reliable sellers on eBay versus 530 minimum on places that still weren't guaranteed stock. So I was like, I kind of need to build this thing in September and I could wait, let's say, another month or two for it to maybe come back into stock and for it to come back down to 480 But as of this point, there is, there is a £100 difference between buying a 9900K versus buying a 3900X. And also, if you factor in the motherboard, uh, the motherboard that I needed to get was about £80 more expensive with the Ryzen. So almost £200 difference for not £200 worth of performance increase over the 9900K. So for my specific usage case, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go with the 9900K. That's the one I wanted originally anyway, and I'm not going to be disappointed considering that I paid about 430 for it and not like the 490 or so that was floating around at before the Ryzen chips dropped. So for 430, I went with an i9 9900K and I'm absolutely happy with it. It runs really, really well. And that was one of the main components that I brought and it was one of the first ones that I got. So of course, once I decided on my CPU, now I could get my motherboard. And for this one, uh, one of the channels I use most and a channel that I hugely recommend that you guys check out if you're into tech is a channel called Optimum Tech. Uh, this guy has some incredible videos about small form factor PCs and just about PC technology stuff in general. I probably watched like 30, 40, 50 of his videos over the summer, just learning about small form factor cases, what works, what doesn't, and all that kind of stuff. And he provided absolutely invaluable information. And based on uh, his review, there is a mini ITX motherboard suitable for this CPU. And it's the ASRock Phantom Z390 mini ITX. And this one was about £180 that I found on Amazon. It was pretty much that price throughout the entire summer. It doesn't seem to fluctuate very much, but it has pretty much everything that I would have needed from this motherboard. Uh, apparently the VRMs are very good as well, so it can handle the power of something like a 9900K. It also has a Thunderbolt port, which is something that could be useful in the future. I don't particularly need it right now, but if I'm planning to use this PC for a few years at least, having a Thunderbolt port is something that's definitely useful. Uh, it's a half speed one, I don't think it's not 40 gigabit, it's 20 gigabit, but you know, for most intents and purposes, that's still perfectly fine. So that's the, the motherboard that I went with. 
And once I did that as well, it was time to move on to stuff like the RAM and the power supply and all of that business. The power supply was one of the easiest and it's going to be the shortest segment I think here because all I had to do was find a power supply that was compatible with small form factor systems. So you've got your regular ATX ones and you've got your SFX ones. I had to go with SFX and in this realm there is only one power supply that offers 750 watts and that is the Corsair SF750 Platinum Edition or something like that. Now of course as power supplies go it's a little bit pricey. Um, I got mine for £126, but if, if you're trying to do what I'm trying to do, if you want to build a powerful system in a small form factor case, it's pretty much a no-brainer. I think there's a Seasonic one that's like 700 watts or something like that, but I figured the extra little bit of overhead would be good as well. And I think in terms of price, there was barely any difference. And I know Corsair, and I know that their PSUs are fantastic and they offer good warranty and all that kind of stuff. So I just went with the fully modular, Corsair SF750 as my PSU. Next up is the RAM and for this one of course I wanted to go low profile on the RAM to just like leave as much space for other stuff as possible. There's no point putting in any kind of big flashy RAM in there that's just going to be more expensive and that's not really going to help me in terms of my build. So I wanted to go low profile. Uh, obvious choice of this was the Corsair LPX ones and I was looking at those and I kind of kicked myself a bit because there were some good sales on those. And I could have got the 32 gig that I wanted for about 130 pounds, 135 pounds, something like that. But the summer had gone by and it was about 20 to 30 pounds more expensive. So I kept checking like um, Amazon and all that stuff every day. And it was just hovering around the 160 mark. I decided to go for the 3200 megahertz CL16 timing one. Uh, based on what I'd read, that was kind of a sweet spot. And if you try to go something that's a lot more kind of faster than that, like 3600, 4000, whatever, it's just going to be diminishing returns, it's going to be too expensive. So if, in terms of like my build and as high as I was willing to go, I was willing to spend about 150 on RAM. So for that money, in terms of 32 gig, that was pretty much the best you could get. So I wanted to go with that. But I was looking through and around the time when I started to put everything together, there were some crucial ballistics ones on sale with the same specs as the Corsair one and it was about 150 pounds. And I really like the color of these as well. I think they look better than the uh, than the all black Corsair ones. Because I knew I was going to have a bit of a black and grayish, black and silverish kind of build. I thought these uh, these ram sticks look pretty cool. Even though they're not going to be seen very much in the build. I thought, you know what? At the end of the day, they're a little bit cheaper than the Corsair ones. They perform just as well. They've got fantastic reviews. So I was like, yeah, I'll just get those. So I got two 16 gig Corsair Ballistics uh, 3200 megahertz ram with CL16 timings and that's what I used for the system. Next up is storage. Now with storage my initial plan was to go with uh, NVMe SSD as my main boot drive and to have a big SSD as my second drive. One of the things about small form factor systems is that it can be a little bit more difficult to put big storage in here. So of course because of the, the whole problem with pricing like a 4 terabyte mechanical hard drive which for now and in general is fine for what I want to do is not going to fit inside that case and if you want to go something like 4 terabyte on SSD then you're looking at like crazy money I think it's like I think probably like 300 pounds at the very least for a 4 terabyte SSD and I wasn't really sure I wanted to spend that much money on storage right now so the plan was to get a 1 terabyte um, NVMe SSD for the main like OS and just for just to have that one terabyte of extra space available. And aside from that, I figured I would get a two terabyte, two and a half inch SATA SSD as my secondary drive. And for now, that should be enough. Uh, over time, if I decided that that's not enough, like three terabytes of total storage is not cutting it, then there's room for a second SSD if I want to put one in. And my motherboard has room for a second NVMe SSD if I want to put one in there. So maybe like next year or something, uh, I don't mind investing another few hundred pounds on getting upgraded storage that's going to again last me for the years to come. So that was the initial plan and um, I was looking into the SSDs and of course uh, the most popular one is the, the Samsung Evo. Now the Samsung Evo 970 has incredible specs and it, it performs amazingly well and has fantastic reviews, very reliable, all that good stuff. But even for a one terabyte, I think it was like, I think the cheapest it ever been was around £150 and that was on like some crazy sale. But it tended to hover around the 170, 180 mark. And for me, that was that was too much. That was outside of my price range. 
And I figured instead of going down to 512, uh, I'd rather just go with a different brand and just see how we do. So I found out about um, a make called Sabrin, and they have a NVMe SSD called the Rocket, which has really nice specs for the price. I think it's about, I think it's like almost as fast as the Evo, and it was about 50 to 60% cheaper than the Evo was. Of course, the main question is reliability, uh, should I trust this brand, all that kind of stuff. Then, of course, it was time for research. I went in, you know, I looked at lots of different Amazon reviews, I went on different sites, uh, just to see if people who had bought this, this NVMe SSD were happy with it. And based on what I'd seen, the reviews were really fantastic. And I was like, you know what, it's worth a go. It's got like a, a five year warranty, I think, or a six year warranty. And I was like, let's give this a go because the price is just too good and the specs are good and the reviews are good. And I don't have like any particular brand loyalty in terms of SSDs. So I was like, let's just go for it and see how it goes. So currently I have a Sabrent Rocket one terabyte NVMe SSD drive as like my main OS drive. Then, uh, as I was looking through, of course, during this, this period, every single day, I've got a list of components that I want, and I'm looking at, at sales to see if there's anything on, if anything's dropped in price, then I can snag a good deal, and I can save myself like 5%, 10% off the cost. And if you can cumulatively do this for every single part that you're buying, if you're going to spend like pretty big bucks on building a PC, it's all going to add up. So let's say if your budget is £2,000, and you're finding ways to save like 5 to 15, 20% on each component that you buy, that's going to add up and that's going to be a lot more money in your pocket that you can spend on even more storage or you can buy yourself, I don't know, a nicer keyboard or some other things, some headphones, whatever you want to buy. So I was always looking into trying to find the best deal that I could at any given time. And with this situation, uh, I woke up one day and I saw that there was a 2 terabyte NVMe SSD that was on sale and it was literally cheaper at the time than any 2.5 inch SATA SSD that I could find. What I ended up getting was an Intel, I think it's the 660p, a 2 terabyte NVMe hard drive. It has read and write speeds I believe of 1800 megabytes per second, which puts it at more than three times faster than the 2.5 inch SSDs with SATA cable connections. So I was like, hold on, not only is this faster than the SSD I wanted to buy, like much faster, noticeably faster. I don't have to deal with an extra set of cables that's gonna clog up even more of my small form factor system and it's a little bit cheaper. So I think it was about 185 pounds or something for the two terabyte NVMe. And I was like, this is too good a deal to miss. So I'm gonna go for this one because looking at price history, I think the cheapest I'd ever seen um, a 2.5 inch SSD at two terabytes was around 170 mark at the time. So I was like, you know, if that's the cheapest it's ever been, and currently they're either very similarly priced or they're a little bit more expensive, I was like, this is a no-brainer. It's just less clutter in my system and greater performance. And based on what I'd read of the Intel 660p, again, it's got good warranty, pretty decent reliability as well. I'm going to take the plunge. And so I filled up the second M.2 NVMe SSD slot on my motherboard, and I put in a 2 terabyte Intel 660p for a total of 3 terabytes of storage. Like I said, if in the future 4K content, uh, I don't know, more videos, different kinds of videos, I'm looking like it's not going to be enough for me. There's still room for two, two and a half inch uh, SATA drives on the case. So I can just put those in, maybe get two more two terabytes or depending on pricing, get one more four terabyte and we'll see how we go. But for now, I'm not going to be filling up that three terabyte anytime soon. I've got my 20 terabyte backup hard drive where I store all of the videos I've made as well. And that's not even like half full. So I've got that as like a backup as well. So in terms of storage, I think I should be pretty much all good. Okay, so I think I've walked you through most of it. Um, I think one thing I'll talk about before the GPU, which was the, the thing that I'm probably going to talk about the most, was the liquid cooling and the case fans. So um, when you're working small form factor especially, you don't have the room to put in uh, these big air coolers from like Noctua and all these kind of brands. Ideally, I would have liked to do that because I'm a newbie when it comes to building computers and liquid cooling just in general scares me a bit. I'm like, oh no, what if it leaks? What if it like destroys my whole PC and all this kind of stuff? So I was, I was a little bit apprehensive about liquid cooling it. But if you want that small form factor and you want to use a very powerful CPU, that's pretty much the, the only choice that you have if you want to run things coolly and you want to run it with low noise. So that's exactly what I did. I was looking into the coolers. And um, what I didn't want was a whole ton of RGB and all this kind of shit because what I do quite often 
is leave my PC running overnight to render stuff and obviously I don't want a whole bunch of like disco lights and shit bouncing around my room while I'm trying to sleep. So I know you can switch them off but just RGB in general like some small touches are kind of nice but I didn't want this to be to look like those um, those expensive bills that you see when you like type it up and they've got all kinds of weird shit going on. I just wanted a nice sleek quite stealthy build that was just going to get the job done for me and still look pretty while doing it. So there were two products here I was considering. One was the Corsair H100i Pro, I believe, and the other is the NZXT X52 Kraken. Now, I love the look of the Kraken. Um, I think the reason I considered it most was because Optimum Tech, the guy I mentioned before, he always uses that, and he says it's a good one to use for small form factor cases. So once again, the process began. I went into Amazon, I started reading reviews, started comparing the two, and for some reason, like, two things stood out for the X52 for me. Um, the first thing was a lot of people were complaining about like pump failures and all this kind of stuff. I'm pretty sure that every single liquid cooler ever made has some percentage of them that will fail within the first year, let's say. That's the same for all of them. But I don't know, just reading through, I, se I seem to notice it happened more with the, with the X52 than with the Corsair one. So that was one thing. And the second was that the, the software that the X52 uses apparently is just really, really annoying. Like if you go onto Amazon and you read about the X52, a lot of the comments will talk about how crap and annoying the, the software is for it. And I was like, you know what, I don't want to deal with this shit. Corsair, once again, tried and tested. Um, you know, it's very reliable. It's, it's been in the game for a long time. I personally know it really well, even though I'm not a huge like PC nerd. So I was like, let's just, let's just go with the, the H100i Pro and let's put that in and see how we do. So that's the 240mm AIO liquid cooling solution that I chose for my build. In terms of case fans, there's actually only room for one case fan here outside of the, the radiator that you're mounting. So there's a bottom case fan. And in terms of airflow for the build, I've done a little bit of research on this. And for the particular case that I'm using, it seems like having a system where you intake air from the bottom and you use your... AIO's fans as an exhaust seem to work the best. Uh, I'll explain why a little bit later, but that's the setup I went for. And of course, when it comes to small form factor builds, things like noise and heat are much, much more important. If you're building in a much bigger case and it's underneath your desk, you're not really going to think about it too much. But for this build, I had to try and put a lot of effort into keeping the system cool and keeping it noise free. Now, I think you already know where I'm going with this, but one thing I read that made a genuine difference to your case temperatures and case noise was to use Noctua fans instead of the normal supplied ones. So that's exactly what I did. Uh, the normal Noctua fans I find really ugly, like annoyingly ugly, but thankfully they have this Redux range, which is a more budget range that offers the same performance with slightly worse acoustics from what I'm reading. So that's what I decided to do. I decided to swap the fans that came with the Corsair with uh, a couple of with a couple of four pin Noctua Redux fans that are just like this greyish color that generally suit my build. So that's why I went for with those and they definitely run quiet and they definitely put out a lot of air. So I've been very happy with the Noctua fans. Would definitely recommend it to anyone that's after a quiet and cool PC. In terms of bottom intake, I decided to go with Noctua again. They've got these Chromax fans. Uh, normally the case supports 120 millimeters, but Based on a video that I saw made by someone else, you can fit 140 in there. And I was like, okay, let's put the 140. So I brought a black 140 millimeter Noctua Chromax fan for that as well. And that's my intake fan. I think I just leave it on all the time because it's so quiet. I think I run it at like 30% or 40% and I just leave it on all the time. And that's just intaking air and helping to, to push the air towards the exhaust fans up top. So that's what I went with for case fans. I've been very happy with those. It's a no-brainer. If you really do want the best case fans, Noctua still, I think, is the best in the business when it comes to that stuff. So then, the final and probably most important ingredient of this entire build is the GPU. The GPU is the reason why you're doing this thing, because without that GPU, you're not going to be able to game in 4K, and that's what, that, that's what we're here for. That's what we're trying to do here. So, like I mentioned uh, near the start of the video, I had already concluded that there was pretty much no cost-effective way to, to get a high-end graphics card that's going to be playing games in 4K that's going to not break the bank. If you want a game in 4K at close to 60 frames per second, you are going to have to break the bank. That's just how it is right now. Uh, if I was building for myself, 
and I didn't care as much about like content creation and I want to start putting out 4K content, all this kind of stuff, I would have gone with a much lower end GPU. But I was like, look, this is my job. This is why I earn money from. I want to invest in my channel. I want to invest in my own content. I want to try and build the best thing that I can afford with my current situation. That's why I decided to not pinch pennies on the GPU. I was like, if there's one component where there's not much you can do, you just got to spend the money if you want the best, it's the GPU. Now, that being said, I was looking into the performance and the and the prices and all that stuff. And obviously, based on everything I've said, you need to get a 2080 Ti. Because if you're gaming in 4K, it's my belief that the 2080 Ti is the best card for it. Because even the 2080, I think you have to turn down some settings to get to 60 FPS in 4K. And I guess, well, if you're doing that, is it is it really like, you might as well just go to the 2070 Super and just turn down another couple of settings to get to to get to 60. So from what I know, the 2080 Ti as a single graphics card solution is your best bet if you if you're truly after 60p 4K gaming in the year 2019. So I was looking into it, and even though I've told you all these things, I was just seeing the price tag of the 2080 Ti, and I was like, man, I just can't do it. I can't I can't justify it to myself. I was like, it's just it's 1,100 pounds right now. And that is like the, the founder's edition. The, a lot of the like the aftermarket ones, they're even more expensive. I'm seeing them for like 1,200, 1,300. I'm like, this is just insane. Like it's just so much more expensive. And I'm looking at the 2080 Super that has come out. Now, if you overclock the 2080 Super, you can get to within about 10, 15% of the performance of a stock 2080 Ti. But the 2080 Ti is more than 400 pounds more expensive than the 2080 Super. And I was like, this is just not adding up. It's just it's just so insanely expensive that I just, I can't justify, I just can't do it. And so I decided that yes, despite my dream of like, you know, 4K, 60p, it's just overpriced. And I can't be giving Nvidia 1,100 pounds of my money for the 2080 Ti right now. It, I just couldn't make it work in my head. I couldn't justify it. So I was like, let's just go with the 2080 Super. Yes, that's also very expensive, 669 pounds. But I was like, at least, you know, it's it's something that I can live with. £669 is, is the kind of money that was okay to spend on my build. Because in general, it's a very high-end build. So 669 on the GPU, that's the second best GPU money can buy. That I can justify in my head. And I can still get some pretty decent 4K performance from this card. So yeah, I've, I just went for it. I found uh, the Founders Editions get sold out pretty quick on Nvidia's site. But I was keeping an eye on it. And I think after about a couple of weeks, I saw one that was made available and I was like, okay, bang, let's go for it. Got the 2080 Super. So I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, yeah, but you're talking about the 2080 Super, but in all the B-roll, I'm seeing that you had a 2080 Super, but now you've got a 2080 Ti in there. So what's the deal with that? You said all this stuff and you still went out and bought a 2080 Ti. Well, that's absolutely true. And that's a, that's a whole story in and of itself. So during this whole dilemma about the 2080 Super versus the 2080 Ti, the main reason why I didn't go for the 2080 Ti is, of course, cost. But I was like, I wish if it was coming down to like the 850 kind of mark, I might be able to justify it because there is a very legit performance increase over the 2080 Super. It's noticeably better. And I guess for that kind of price, maybe I can justify it. It's like the absolute limit of what I'm willing to pay for something like a 2080 Ti. So that was what I had in my head. And again, I'm checking out things like eBay to see what kind of offers I can find. Even with like used slash refurbished 2080 Ti's, the best prices I was seeing was around the 900 mark. And to be honest, the, the prospect of, of having a 2080 Ti, like the, the best graphics card money can buy, is just so appealing that I was like, oh, like should I take the plunge and should I just spend this money and just get the 2080 Ti and then that way I have peace of mind, like I won't have any regrets about having the best card because I feel like if I got a 2080 Super and something happened where there was a price slash on the 2080 Ti or something happened and it was like 850, 900, I'd be like, oh man, I kind of wish I'd spend that extra 200 pounds just to, just to have the best graphics card and to have that 20, 25, 30% better performance and to truly be able to play games in 4K at 60 FPS with pretty much the settings that I'd want to play them on. But reality was not being kind to me. I mean, everywhere I was looking, it was just like, it was either refurbished cards or it was used cards. Now I was looking into the EVGA ones because EVGA has fantastic warranty. 
And I was like, if there's one that's, that looks in really great condition and there's still a lot of warranty time left, I feel like it might be worth the plunge if the price is right because you can transfer the ownership and all that kind of stuff. So if something goes wrong, I can just use it like I bought it myself. So the EVGA cars were quite appealing in that sense. Now I was looking, I think the cheapest, I spent a whole summer just looking at these cars every single day. And the cheapest I could find was around 900 pounds. There was a few times I was close to pulling the trigger, but again, even at around 900, it was like, it was like 60, 40 in terms of not buying it. So in the end, I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm not gonna buy it, just settle on the 2080 and just get that. So the 2080 came, uh, I, I put it in my system and I fired it up. And of course, like in general, it's great. I don't have a 4K monitor yet uh, in my bedroom in the UK. So I wasn't able to test it in 4K, but obviously at 1080, it was just absolutely just ripping everything to shreds as expected. So the setup is not quite yet complete. Uh, when I come back in a couple of months time, I'm gonna hopefully get myself a 4K monitor, but I didn't need to make that investment right now. So I just continuing to use my 1080 for a few weeks while I'm here. But yeah, I had the 2080 Super. It was going okay. I didn't have any problems with it. It looked really sexy. I really like the Founders Edition for the, the 20 series. I really think they're beautiful and everything was, was going okay. Then one day uh, I'm going onto eBay and I see that there is a code and it's 10% off for all electronics. And of course I'm like, hmm, like this could be interesting. So I decided to search for 2080 Ti's just to, just to see what's available. And at this point, the, the best kind of deals I've been seeing are around 900-ish or maybe like 860, 870, always for used or refurbished cards. I go in and I see a listing, guy uh, looking for a quick sale and they're selling a 2080 Ti. And if I apply the, the discount, the 10% discount, I can get it for about 850. It's a Founders Edition, which is the edition I wanted, which I'll explain a little bit later. But it's a Founders Edition, brand new, reliable seller, £850. That was, the, that was the moment where I was like, you know what? You're thinking about this so much, even though you, you've bought the 2080 Super, clearly your mind is still on that TI, you want that TI. You know, you're investing money into, into your career, into your content, all that stuff. Just screw it. You found it for a great price. It's unlikely you're going to find it for a price like this for quite some time. Just go for it, man. Just get that 2080 Ti and just make yourself happy. Because even though I know that even at 850, it's still overpriced. I was like, you know what? It is the best graphics card out there and it's going to cater to all of my needs for quite some time to come. So fuck it. Let's do it. Let's get the 2080 Ti. So I made it happen. I got the 2080 Ti and I sent back the, the 2080 Super that I received. So all was good with the world and I ended up with my dream GPU and in general my dream computer setup. Quick mention about peripherals, uh, not ready for the monitor yet, that's going to be in a couple of months time. I'll probably get something that's like 32 inches or maybe just get like a 40 inch TV. If I can find one that has a good response time, uh, I might go for like a 40 inch 4K HDR kind of TV because I only need 60 frames per second, I'm not interested in uh, ultra high FPS gaming and um, I don't play a lot of like, you know, fast reaction uh, shooters and that kind of stuff where the response time is absolutely critical. You need like that one millisecond response time or whatever. For me and the kind of games I want to play, just like some kind of 40 inch 4K HDR thing with some kind of decent response time at least is more than enough for me and everything is going to look gorgeous on it and I'll be more than happy with that. But that's for like another couple of months or so. Uh, keyboard and mouse. Um, for keyboard, I decided to go with a Corsair Strafe. I was looking for a silent, reliable RGB keyboard because I do like my RGB when it comes to the keyboard. I think that's really nice. Uh, this was one I found. I think I found it for about £80. It hovers between 80 and 100 depending on what sales are on. So that's the one that I got. Uh, it's got Cherry MX silent switches. So it, I've gone back to Mechanical, my previous one that you've seen in my How I Make My Videos video. Uh, is like a Corsair K50 or something like that and it's not mechanical but this one is mechanical but it has the silent switches so it hasn't bothered me too much at all and it looks really sturdy, well made, fantastic keyboard, loving using it so far. Uh, in terms of mouse, again I want to go with as few wires as possible, I didn't want to have a wired mouse and once again I don't play like really high paced competitive shooter games where I use my mouse and all that kind of stuff. So I don't need a gamer mouse or anything like that. So I decided to go with a wireless one that still had, you know, 
I didn't want to just go for like a really plain looking like office type of mouse because I've got like the RGB keyboard, uh, I've got the sexy graphics card and all that kind of stuff. I felt like at least in some small way it'd be nice if it matched that kind of aesthetic. So I was looking around and I was pretty shocked because I currently have a wireless mouse that's like a really cheap, um, I think it's like eight pounds or something like that that I got from Amazon. It's a TechNet mouse where you put two um, AA batteries in and I think it's got like 18 months of battery life and it works absolutely fine. Like for when I'm using my laptop and I got to edit on my laptop and that kind of thing, I like using my wireless mouse quite a lot for that. But I was like, you know what? I might as well get a slightly better mouse considering I put all this effort and all this money into building something. So I won't use my eight pound mouse with this system. I'll try and buy something a little bit better. So I think I was willing to spend like 30, 40 pounds, something like that. I didn't need like some crazy mouse, which is something that's a little bit better. And um, I was looking into the, the wireless mouses from like Corsair and Razer and all that stuff. And I was shocked because all of them are like, the battery life is like 50 hours or something. And they don't have, um, they're all kind of like USB charged and stuff. You don't have uh, external batteries that you put in. And that's it. And I was like, what? Like 50 hours? My, my eight pound one is like, it lasts for a year and a half. So it didn't really make much sense to me. I was like, well, obviously I don't want that because I'm using my, my computer. It's on for like 10, 12 hours a day. So I don't want to be recharging my mouse like constantly. That's, that defeats the purpose because I need a cable to recharge it in the first place. Now, of course, there's reasons for that because, you know, it's got, I don't know, it's RGB, uh, it's so responsive, the DPI is so high, it's so much more high performance than my shitty eight pound one that obviously it's gonna drain the battery a lot quicker. But I figured surely there's gotta be a mouse out there that is wireless, it's still a high performing mouse, but it's got the battery life as well. Like surely there's gotta be something. Because I thought maybe these things have like an eco mode. So maybe there's a gamer mode where it's, you know, it's got all the bells and whistles and then yes, it lasts 50 hours. But surely there's got to be like an office mode or something where when you use it like that, then it lasts you like a few months or something. So looking around, uh, I found a Logitech G305 and I think it was around 40 pounds. And I figured, you know what? This is pretty much what I'm looking for because it has about 250 hours of battery life. You can put it in like a low power mode, which is basically like what I said that I wanted. It was like a office mode kind of thing where you probably won't use it if you're doing any serious gaming but I'm not doing that with my mouse, so I don't need it. So I was like, yeah, this this seems like more the kind of thing that I'm looking for. So G305, that was the, the mouse I wanted to go for. And then once again, uh, eBay pulled through because there is the, the bigger brother of the G305, which is the 603, which has about double the battery life of the 305. So apparently like in absolute best condition scenario, it can go for like nine months without needing new batteries. And I was like, yeah, like this is more like what I'm talking about a true wireless mouse where I won't need to be using other cables in order to actually charge it all the time. So that was cool, but it was slightly outside my price range. And on eBay, once again, there was a day where there was a code and I found one that was like a damaged box item or something like that. It was all in its original packaging. It was it was new and it came with its like original warranty and all that kind of stuff. And it came to like £42.50 or something like that. And I was like, well, instead of paying 40 for the 305, let's pay £2.50 extra and get the 603. So I ended up with the, the Logitech G603 mouse. Again, so far, really happy with it. It's a little bit bigger than my old crappy mouse, but in terms of like the fit and stuff, because my hands are a little bit bigger than average, uh, it fits fine. I mean, I've enjoyed using it so far, no problems. And hopefully the battery does live up to its hype and it will last for many months. And that will be exactly what I'm after. So there we go guys, that is everything that is used in this build with the reasons why and the prices which I got them for. So hopefully that will help some of you guys if you want to build something similar or in case you want advice from someone who's not some like big tech YouTuber who might have other interests, they might have sponsorships and all that kind of shit. Just so everybody knows, none of this PC was sponsored by anyone. Uh, I paid for every single component myself, like no one sent me anything for free. I did send out a few speculative emails like asking if any of these like manufacturers were interested in sending me stuff. Nothing happened. So I just decided, you know what, screw it. This is for me. This is me investing in the channel. Got to spend the money. Let's just do it. And that way I'm not affiliated with any particular brand or anything like that. There's a whole bunch of different brands in here and I don't have to, to say anything particular or do anything particular. And I can just be completely honest about everything I've used and everything that I've done. So that's the deal. All of the parts uh, are my own hard-earned cash. And that is the situation with the PC and all the components within it.